recording. And check our settings. It's good. Audio's good. Here we go. Last chapter, electrochemistry. And this will be the topic for our lab next week, too. I'm kind of surprised. Oh, shoot. That's a stupid mistake. Because I have delta H is equal to 137, and I, I knew that it was endothermic. I don't know why, but I, that was just a stupid mistake. Like putting your decimal in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. Oh well, the 88 still. And you still have plenty of buffer. That's what I'm thinking. With my other grades, it's, yeah. it's not going to take me down too much. That's a frustrating one because that was an eight-point question. Why did they have to make a stupid mistake on that? <clears throat> okay, electrochemistry. This is the study of the uh, exchange of chemical and electrical energy. So we can think of chemical energy as uh, whatever happens to be stored in the reactants, and the electrical part is what we can derive from that reaction assuming that the reaction is spontaneous. If the reaction is not spontaneous, you can't derive any energy from it. But remember, if it's spontaneous, if it's non-spontaneous in one direction, it's spontaneous in the other. So that means you flip the reaction around, you can gain electrical energy from it. Now our terms. I'm not sure if, if we've gone over these before. But the, um, uh, the definitions of oxidation and reduction and so forth. Um, have I ever shown you guys this one? Oil rig? Okay. Oxidation is loss. So if electrons are lost, that reactant is being oxidized. I think I remember this from the first semester. Okay. Not oil rate, but uh, the oxidation reduction. Because we, we covered uh, those kind of reactions, I think. Mm -hmm. And reduction is gain. I remember it was just confusing then. Because oxidation, or rather, not oxidation, but reduction being the gain. Yeah. <laughs> That's why the mnemonic. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so um, suppose we have uh, this reaction. Uh, let me just let me write it up here so I can annotate it. Yeah, that's still visible. Okay. So we need to determine um, how the electrons have moved. And we'll deal with this in just a second. But I want to talk about this reaction standalone, and it's already balanced. Right? We're going to deal with balancing equations in just a minute. So if iron starts off at a two plus charge, and it ends up at a three plus charge. It, How did the electrons move? It gained an electron, so it reduced. No, it gained, it lost electrons, so it was, right. it was oxidized. 
So we've got um, uh, loss, one electron per iron. And that's not, oh, I forgot this right now. Now it's back. Plus five electrons. Right. So times five equals five electrons uh, were transferred here. But where did they go? You can't have a. Hey! <laughs> there you go. Are you feeling better? A little bit, not much. Okay. I'm going to mark you present. Yeah, we just started and went through our definitions of oxidation and reduction using this mnemonic oil rig. Um, do you have copies of this stuff already? Because it's available on Blackboard. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we were taking this equation as an example, which is already balanced and discussing those terms. So this one would be loss of electron would be um, oxidation, right? And oxidations never occur without uh, an equally weighted reduction. In other words, you can't have one without the other. So something has to be reduced in order for this oxidation to take place. And uh, more than likely, it's this manganese. So let's see, what's the, um, what's the oxidation state on manganese? Well, oxygen is always two minus. Right? So that means eight minus total, and we have to reserve one minus for the charge. So that means seven minuses have to be balanced by manganese. So manganese is going to be seven plus. It goes from seven plus to two plus. So that means it had to gain electrons. So we had gain five electrons per manganese. And there's only one manganese, so that's five electrons. So now we have five electrons being uh, gained here, five electrons being lost there. That's good, that's balanced. So this is uh, reduction. And in this case, we say that um, the manganate ion was reduced and the iron ion was oxidized. Okay. We can also say that um, whatever has been reduced serves as the oxidizing agent. Because since it was reduced, it causes the oxidation of this reactant. So it's the oxidizing agent. And conversely, whatever is oxidized is the reducing agent. Okay. Now, <clears throat> um, these two equations break out the parts of the reaction that are uh, essential for reduction, and this one for oxidation. So now, we're going to use the half reaction method. Those two reactions that we saw on the previous slide are called half reactions. But half reactions never stand alone. They're only a means to an end. So in order to, in order to balance an equation, uh, a redox equation we call it, um, sometimes the best way, um, even the only way that you can balance it, is to uh, parse out that equation into those parts that say this one's oxidized, this one's reduced. And that's what this method calls for. 
So if you have an equation that needs to be balanced, then you write separate equations for oxidation and reduction. And then for each of the reactions, you go through these steps. <clears throat> you balance all the elements first that are not hydrogen and oxygen. The reason for that is we're going to deal with hydrogen and oxygen later as acid and water. So you do the non-hydrogen oxygen elements first, then you balance the oxygens using uh, water. And I'll show you how that works in just a minute. Then you balance the hydrogens that you've, that you've added here by this process with protons. And the last thing you do is you balance the uh, charges. Now this is for each equation, each half reaction. Then you balance the electrons for that half reaction. Okay. Now in order to get the equations back together in the final form, we may have to multiply one or both of them by some factor in order for the uh, electrons to balance. But once you do that, then you can add them back together and then you check to see if your uh, charges balance. Okay, and there's a schematic. This is the half reaction method for acidic solution, right? Because we use protons, water and protons. Some reactions occur in basic solution. And I'm gonna show you how to do that one after we learn this one because the basic solution balancing technique is just a modification of the acidic technique. So here's an example of a, an equation that's not balanced. So we have the dichromate ion. And notice, <clears throat> very often when you're given equations like this, they will be given in the forms of ions. These would be analogous to net ionic equations. In other words, the spectators are not included. So we would put, uh, you could have a sodium here, you could have a potassium there as part of your dichromate, just to get it into solution. Um, you could do similarly here, sodium, potassium would be good choices for that uh, sulfide ion. Uh, but they're not essential to balancing the equation, so we leave them out. And I'm going to leave out the aqueous part, just for uh, economy. And then we're going to get chromate ion and sulfate ion. Okay. So now, um, you may want to, um, of course, on a test, if I'm giving you a question and telling you to balance this using the half reaction method, you can assume that an oxidation reduction has taken place. But if you're out on your own and you encounter a reaction and you want to see if this technique is the one that's best to balance the equation, you probably want to go in and say, all right, let me be sure that we've got an oxidation reduction going on here. So chromium is going to be three plus, and how about this chromium? Well, it's two minus for the oxygen, 14 minus total, reserve two, 12 minus. So 12 minus divided by two is going to be six plus. So six plus to three plus, yeah, we do have an oxidation reduction going on. That justifies using this method. We'll do that again in a second. First of all, you want to separate these out as half reactions. Well, actually, we, we would have to do that. Six plus to three plus. So this reaction is going to be what? This is the reduction reaction. This chromium to that chromium has been reduced because we've added electrons. It has gained electrons. So the reduction reaction is going to be this one.
and we leave ourselves plenty of space. Okay, that means the oxidation reaction, let me put it down here some more. Is going to be this one to that. Okay. Now let's see. <clears throat> what would be, let's see, this one's going from six plus to three plus. And of course, if you've only got one element and that's the charge, that's the oxidation state. Okay. If it's a pure element, the oxidation state is zero. Okay, so in this case, uh, oxygen is two minus, so that means six minus total, reserve two for that charge, that means this one has to be four plus, then uh, two minus for oxygen, eight minus, reserve two, six minus, this one's six plus. So the sulfur went from four plus to six plus in this case. Okay, next step. Balance all elements except for oxygen and hydrogen. That means sulfur in this one, which is already balanced. Chromium for this one means you need two here. So two chromiums, two chromiums. That step is done. Now we balance the oxygens with water. So if you've got oxygen on this side, you need oxygen on this side as water. Okay? So we've got seven oxygens here. We need seven oxygens there. How about this one? We've got three oxygens and two oxygens here. So that means we had to add one oxygen. Right? So there's one oxygen, there's three, that makes four. Now we do the hydrogens. We added 14 hydrogens here. That means we need 14 hydrogens on this side. Okay? We added uh, two hydrogens here, so that means we need two hydrogens on this side. Okay. Now we need to balance the electrons. Right? So if you've got, um, if you go from six plus, to three plus, we've gone what? We've added or gained three electrons per chromium. But we've got two chromiums, which means six electrons. We're gaining. So if we gain electrons, which side does it go? It goes on this side, right? Because if we gain six electrons, Six, um, yeah, we gain six electrons on this side. Where are they on that side? They're inside the chromium, right? Satisfying shell. Right. So we need six electrons here. And then for this one, we lost. Um, from four plus to six plus, we lost two electrons per sulfur. And we've only got one sulfur, so that's two electrons. So when you lose two electrons, they end up on the product side. Right. Here we go. So now the half reactions are balanced at this point. But we can't combine them yet because we have six electrons here and two electrons there. And in the, in the balanced equation, you don't have any electrons showing. So we've got to be able to cancel this six electrons with electrons here, which means we need to multiply this whole thing by a factor to give us six electrons. Okay, so it'll be three times this, three times that, three times this, three times that, three times that. Okay, I'm gonna have
have to erase some of this in order to get them to combine. I need space. Right. So now this one becomes three sulfites plus three waters yields three sulfates plus six hydrogens plus six electrons. So now we're going to combine this equation and this equation. Okay, we can bring, we know that the electrons are going to cancel. We designed the equation that way. Right, so we don't have to write the electrons. But we are gonna write the dichromate, okay? And then we're gonna write the sulfate, uh, sulfite, excuse me, it's, which is three. Uh, this should be three, excuse me. Three, two minus, okay? Then on this side, we also have 14 hydrogens and three waters. Okay, that takes care of the reactant side. On the product side, we have two chromiums, three plus, and we have three sulfates, Minus. Then we have seven waters. Okay. And we have six hydrogens. Okay. Remember, I already canceled out the electrons. Now, all these steps are on subsequent slides. I'm just doing them here because I think it flows better uh, if we actually do the procedure on the board and then you have the slides as backup. Okay, now can we cancel on either side? Any terms? We have 14 hydrogens here, six hydrogens there. So these will cancel and leave us with eight here. Waters. We've got three waters on that side, seven on that side. So these will cancel and leave us with four waters on that side. So that should be balanced. And you can check yourself. <clears throat> you can look at the uh, two chromiums. We've got seven plus nine is. 16 oxygens, and over here we've got 12 plus 4 is 16 oxygens, and here we have 8 hydrogens and 8 hydrogens. Okay. So let's see. Final balanced equation. There, there, there. That's good, that's good. Okay. So I'm, I managed to balance it without any major power ups. It's like any balancing procedure. Like the way I, I showed the uh, um, budgeting process for balancing equations. You, some, Redox equations can be balanced that way, but some of them just defy logic. I mean, you, they won't let you balance them at all unless you use the half reaction method. And of course, if you're given a question on a test, let's say if if we we haven't we because we don't have to find out here, do we? We have to find out. There we go. We don't have a final. This is the final. Uh, but if we had a final, or if you were involved in a final in chemistry, and you were given um, an equation 
and you're trying to figure out which way to use to balance it, usually what you'll see is you'll have nothing but ions in there. That's a giveaway. Use the half reaction method for those. Okay. So let's make some room. Now, when you balance these equations like that, later on, we're going to need to know how many electrons were transferred. So when those electrons, like in this case, six electrons on one side and six on the other, when those cancel to make our final reaction, don't forget that you transferred six electrons. Because in future calculations, particularly when we're talking about galvanic cells or batteries, you need to know how many electrons are transferred to do certain calculations. That's just a word to the wise. Um, I'm going to move on to um, balancing in basic solution. Okay, That one that we just did was in acidic solution, and you know because we have protons. In basic solution, you're going to have hydroxyls. But we're going to use what I call the fake acid method. You balance it as if it were at an acidic solution first, then you make the corrections to convert that balanced equation into a basic solution. It's fairly simple. Okay, so let's take an example. Uh, let's see here. This one. So we've got cyanide. cyanide ion and I need to fix that one. Those should be subscripts. Let's see. Where are they? Yeah. Excuse me a second. I need to make a correction here. Subscripts. For future reference. Right, so this four is down, and that minus is up. That could be confusing. And this one, like that. Okay, now we have to decide which is the half reaction for which one. All right, let's take uh, manganese first. The metals tend to be easier to determine their redox, their oxidation states. So this one is two minus times four is eight minus seven minus balance. This means seven plus. This one is two minus times two is four minus. So it's neutral, we balance all four of them with a four plus. So that means manganese has been reduced. So the reduction equation is this one. That's seven plus for that manganese and four plus for that. So the other has to be an oxidation. So we're gonna have cyanide yields That bugger. All right, so what has been oxidized, what's been reduced? Let's see if this gives us any. Well, no, that's the, that's the final answer. I don't want that yet. What we want to do is find out which one of these has been reduced and which one's been oxidized. Typically speaking, 
when you have carbon in a situation like this, it's the one that has been uh, changed. So nitrogen tends to be uh, one, two, three minus. So that means carbon is going to be uh, two plus. Oxygen is uh, two minus, three minus. So that means uh, five minus, we've got to hold out one for that charge. Right. So that means this one is four plus. So the carbon has gone from two plus to four plus. So is that true? It has been oxidized. Okay. And remember, these oxidation states aren't necessarily the underlying activity of each element. It's a bookkeeping scheme. So now that we know what's happened, let's go through our procedure for balancing as if it were acidic. So we've got one manganese, one manganese, that's fine. One carbon, one nitrogen, one carbon, one nitrogen. That's fine. Now we do oxygens using water. So this one has lost two oxygens in the process, and they appear over here as water. Two of them. So four oxygens, two plus four is four oxygens. This one, we gained an oxygen. And only one oxygen, so that was fine. Now hydrogens, we're going to balance it as if it were acidic first. So we've added four hydrogens over here. We need four hydrogens here. And we've uh, there are two hydrogens here. We need those two hydrogens over here. Okay. Now we need electrons. So if we went one manganese to one manganese and we gained three electrons to do that, right? Three minuses and seven pluses equals four plus. This one went from two plus to four plus, which means we had to lose two electrons. And since there's only one carbon, two electrons is it. Since there's only one manganese, three electrons is it. Now we need to match electrons before we can add them back together. We've got an odd here and an even there, cross multiply. So two times this one and three times that one will give you six electrons here, six electrons there that cancel out. So this is going to be two manganate ions plus eight hydrogens plus six electrons yields two manganese dioxide plus four water. Okay. That's the one that's going to be added to this one after we fix it. Three cyanides, three waters, three CNOs, six hydrogens, and six electrons. Okay? So now we can add them together. The electrons cancel. We can bring the manganate ion down. Uh, two manganates. Um, eight hydrogens. And three cyanides. Three waters. That side. And on this side, we have two manganese dioxides, four waters, three
CNOs, six hydrogens, and that's it. Now we can cancel. We've got six hydrogens over here. That means two left over here. We have three waters on this side and four waters on that side. So that means we've only got one water left there. Okay, now that we've got this one balanced as an acid, we need to um, convert it into um, a basic solution. And we do that by neutralizing the protons. We've got two protons here, we need two hydroxyls. And you add them to both sides. So two hydroxyls added to these hydrogens, and then two hydroxyls over here. But those hydroxyls um, don't react with anything. There are no hydrogens on that side. So on this side, these two hydroxyls become two waters. And on this side, we just have, well, of course, we have the hydroxyls, but now we've got a water over there and two over here. That water cancels, and we have one water on this side. So let's uh, clean this up. There. Then we have, I'm going to put this one next. Then we have our one water. We have three CNOs and two hydroxyls. Let's, let's move that one over here. Like that. Now that's your balanced equation in basic solution. Let's see. Three cyanides, two, I left the charge off. Two magnates, uh, one water, and three CNOs, two manganese dioxides, and two hydroxyls. Okay? Any questions? Oh, we need a break. I noticed this is the walk around. I've been running on three hours of sleep for the past three days. Yeah, sure. We can take a break. I'm going to let it run because. As often as not, I forget to turn it back on. <clears throat> and make room for the next operation. Did you get my email? Yeah. Okay, good. You can take it just when you're ready. Okay. You might need a day or two to recover and have time to study. I don't know how long you've been sick, but uh, anytime sick is a <clears throat> drain on your study habits. Yeah, because that's what I usually spend Sunday going over everything, and I didn't I didn't get to do that. And right. That's what I was going to do today, but it's not feeling all that great still. But I'm still going to try to study some. Okay. Um, we are going to have a lab next week. We're going to build our battery. Okay. And that that lab is also on Blackboard. Okay. Um, it's not going to have a formal report with it. So you just uh, will do the procedure and there'll be questions to answer, data to fill in on the hard copy. Um, you can put them in your lab notebook if you want to and then transfer them over to the hard copy, then it'll look nicer. But <clears throat> there's no formal report. 
Okay. Wait. We're taking a break. She's doing she fair. Better? She's doing fair. Fair. Yeah. They say it'd be a long time. Yeah. Her, a very slow process. Yeah, and her, her problem is uh, she has no strength in her legs. Needs to build muscle. Is it both that she's needing strength? Yes, or? yes, both of them. I think that's why she, her, she pulled muscles in both of them because she overstressed the front of that. Strength in her legs to do that. Mm -hmm. It's a little too far. Yeah, I don't know what she said. Yeah. So, I don't. So you got the. Slide is crooked. You see, I get up here without falling down. Doesn't look so crooked on the on the video. Combination of caffeine and sugar. I don't know that caffeine by itself would be as effective. Well, it's honestly not very effective for me, but I also have sugar. <laughs> okay. Is that a diet drink? Yeah. Okay. I've gotten so used to drinking it, I don't know if it's always that kind of thing that now. Okay. So, next slide. The galvanic cell. AKA battery. The galvanic cell is the chemical device that allows us to extract uh, chemical energy in the form of electricity. 
from a process. And remember when we were talking about the conversion of electrochemistry as the uh, study of the relationship between electrical energy and chemical energy, this is how you get at it with the galvanic cell. Um, and in order to, to gain that electrical energy from the process, the cell has to be set up in such a way that the reaction process proceeds spontaneously. Right. So that means overall, the reaction will have a negative delta G. Um, but if we put, uh, if we say take those two half reactions, put them together in a solution, then there will be transfer of electrons, but there's no way you can get at them. They occur in that solution, and you might as well just twiddle your thumbs, because there's no way to get them. The galvanic cell is the setup that allows you to extract energy from those electron transfers, okay? And to do that, we put one half reaction in one cell, one half reaction in the other cell, and force the electrons to travel externally through a wire. Then we can access them as they are transferred from one uh, half reaction to the other, okay? Uh, this is generally what it looks like. You have one half reaction over here, another half reaction over there, and then some way to complete the circuit. I mentioned we had a wire, okay? The external transfer of electrons occurs through this wire, but in any uh, electrical circuit, of course, the definition of circuit means circle. I mean, it's, it's connected. You gotta have a complete circuit in order to get electron transfer. So when we have these two half cells separated, we not only have to connect them with a wire, we've got to connect them with some way for counter ions to move, right? One way is through a salt bridge. That's the way we're going to do it next week. We're going to make a salt bridge, then build our galvanic cell. Um, a more efficient way is to put some sort of porous disc between the two solutions. Then you don't have to add this extra. But the key to the salt bridge or the porous disc working is that they don't allow the solutions to mix. They only allow a controlled transfer of ions to counterbalance the transfer of electrons. Okay. Um, let's see. All right, definitions. The difference between an anode and a cathode. In a galvanic cell, the cathode is the cell in which reduction occurs. So that reduction half reaction that we identified in our balancing procedure goes in the side with the cathode. And the anode is just the opposite. That's where oxidation occurs. So in other words, the cathode is going to be where the electrons arrive through the wire and they're available to reduce something, right? So the electrons are gonna show up over here in this electrode and be transferred into the reaction medium. Whereas the anode, being where oxidation occurs, those where the electrons are leaving this side and being transferred. There's no way to use the energy on the other side. Of this you can't get one without the other, right? The only way to get energy is to have those two half reactions. If you just set up one reaction and nothing over here, nothing's going to happen. So the, the energy derived from the reaction uh, depends on having uh, both an anode and a cathode connected in a circuit.
Now, <clears throat> when those electrons are being transferred, we can measure the push. And it's in terms of voltage, also identified as electromotive force, or EMF. And it's often given this uh, fancy script E uh, as the electromotive force, but it, it's, I'm not sure how I got that E in there, but it's, it's not easy to do. So sometimes we just use a capital E with a subscript for what it refers to. Um, and of course, the larger the E, the greater the driving force, just like with any um, electrical procedure or process that you're familiar with, um, out of the um, wall sockets, we get 120 volts as the electromotive force. Um, if you've got a, an appliance that needs twice that much, you can have 240 volts. Or if you're talking about a, a transformer on the pole outside your house, uh, the electricity coming into it might be 1500 volts or a substation down the line might take in 100,000 volts and step it down to 1,000, 1,500 volts. So the, the force, the push behind the electrons is measurable no matter what process you're talking about, whether it's uh, a galvanic cell or whether it's some um, dynamo at some uh, uh, coal-fired power plant. It's a measure of how hard the electrons are being pushed. So the electrical potential is measured in volts. And a volt uh, has an equivalence in the SI system. And it can be um, uh, equated to one joule of work per coulomb of charge transferred. Coulomb, right, coulomb. Coulomb is just a number. It's kind of like a, a mole. Uh, whereas a mole is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, anything, you know, atoms, ions, chickens. Um, a Coulomb is approximately 6.24 times 10 to the 18th, anything. But in this context, it's generally referred to in terms of charge, right? So. 6.24 times 10 to the 18th um, electrons would be a coulomb of electrons. So one volt is one joule per coulomb. Right. Or it takes, two volts. It takes one joule of uh, work per coulomb. Watch the gray metal ions. Yeah. Metal ions reduce by gaining electrons from electrical current in the electrode. Metal atoms deposit on the cathode as metal ions in solution move toward the cathode and encounter electrons there. Okay. So the cathode, since it's where reduction occurs, if you have a metal ion in solution, then the reduction of that metal ion will uh, occur at the cathode uh, electrode and be deposited on the electrode. So you should see, in this case, you should see the mass of that electrode increase as the cell discharges. Whereas on the other side, in the anode, uh, if it happens to be an anode that uses, uh, that produces metal ions from the metal, because we were extracting electrons from it, we convert uh, zero uh, oxidation state to a plus one, plus two, plus three, whatever it happens to be. Then you have to lose those electrons to be transferred through the wire. And what happens is the metal ion on the electrode is now discharged in, into solution minus its electro or electrons. So that means that electrode, if it is being sacrificed in the process, will decrease in mass at the anode. Now that's not to say that 
that an anode or a cathode electrode in either cell uh, has to be sacrificed or built upon. That's only if you have uh, metal ions that are being oxidized or reduced. Right? Sometimes you have electrodes that are just, just neutral because the reaction in that half cell doesn't involve the electrode at all. But you do need something to pick up the electrons and deliver them to the other side. So we have some sort of inert electrode. Platinum is usually chosen because it's inert and it's not participating in the reaction. Um, there are other types of electrodes. Uh, you can make an electrode out of gas. You just have to have um, a hollow electrode that delivers the gas into solution at a prescribed pressure, and the standard pressure is one atmosphere. Um, we'll talk about that in a little more in just a minute. Watch the green tip of the metal anode on the left. At the anode, metal atoms oxidize to release electrons, which flow as current through the electrode. Positively charged metal ions enter the surrounding solution. The metal ions move toward the salt bridge. Why do they move toward the salt bridge? Because you're transferring negative charge from this half cell to the other half cell, which would set up an imbalance on the other side. Negative charges going over there, so you've got to transfer positive charges in there to balance it. So they go through the salt bridge. Okay, how do we measure cell potential? That is, once you have set up your galvanic cell, let's say this side's the cathode, this side's the anode, and we have a salt bridge. We have our solution, and we have an electrode. In this case, we're going to use a metal and a metal, and then a wire to transfer the electrons. How do we know what the voltage is? I mean, the voltage is there, whether we measure it or not. Yeah, and how do you know which one's the anode and which one's the cathode? Is it just how you set them up? Yes. Yeah, I'm going to show you how to do that in a few minutes. We put something in the middle here called a voltmeter. And it measures the electrical potential. Uh, voltmeters usually these days don't come as separate instruments. Now you go to the store and you buy a multimeter. It does lots of stuff. You can twist your dial and set it up to measure voltage. Yes. You can twist it right. You can measure current. Uh, you, you can turn it around to a little place where all it measures is continuity. And if you have a continuous circuit when it's measured, uh, say you're, you're checking to see if your bulb is burnt out. So you do that and it sends a, a, a small voltage through the circuit and if it's complete, it'll beep. It'll buzz or it'll make a sound. And if the circuit's broken, it won't make anything. Uh, so we use voltmeter to measure the voltage. And we'll be using a, a, a digital voltmeter, so it'll, it'll read off. Uh, what does an analog Analog? Look like? It just has a dial on it, and you have to read it off the dial. Trying to imagine because you know, like a scale with poles, there's a spring, the thing moves. How in the world would that work for a voltmeter? Oh, it's got a spring in it that resists the movement. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> but this is uh, the digital voltmeter is, is the norm now. Okay. So I better leave that up there for now. I might need it again. Um, so we need a way to compare 
uh, different half cells. Um, since you can't operate a half cell independently of another half cell, we need to measure all of our half cells against some standard. And once, once we've measured the value against a standard, then we can compare everybody else. So we choose a standard which is known as the um, standard hydrogen electrode. And that's one cell is the hydrogen electrode and the other cell is the half cell that's being calibrated against it. Right? So the hydrogen electrode is taken as zero uh, electrode potential. It's just accepted as that. And um, the measurement that's made, uh, and that's given in tables, uh, there's one in your book, and I'll throw it up here on, on a slide in a minute. Uh, they're given in standard uh, electromotive force, and with that little zero. Okay, so that zero means that um, if you have solutions, they're going to be one molar concentration. If you've introduced a gas, it's at one atmosphere pressure. And the temperature is always taken as 25 degrees centigrade. Now, when we report the values for all of our measurements against this half cell, this hydrogen, standard hydrogen electrode, they're always reported as reductions, right? So that means you'll have something plus electrons yield something else. And then the standard potential is given. Okay. Uh, let's see. All right, this one, this detail here is important. If you want to know which way a cell is going to proceed spontaneously, that is, that will give you uh, a voltage that you can use to do work, you know, you know, drive your, make your cell phone work or make your um, iTunes play or whatever. The E value for that cell, and that's for both cells, both half cells together, the E value has to be greater than one. I mean, greater than zero. It has to be a positive value. So one isn't necessarily just moving a chair or a piston that's making this work. Oh, yeah. Also work. Uh huh. That's considered work, yeah. Because you're moving electrons. <clears throat> um, okay, so what we're trying to find is the arrangement of half cells that will give us a positive EMF. Here's what, this is only half of the, there's another one on the next page there. Right. So here you see the standard hydrogen electrode is going to take, um, well, hydrogen gas, but it's written as a reduction. So you see all of these have electrons on the left-hand side, right. whatever they happen to be. This one's on the uh, reactant side. And for the standard electrode, it doesn't matter, right? Whether you write it this way or the other way, because it's taken as zero, okay? So zero is zero, whether you do it this way or flip it that way. Still zero, 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 either way. If we need to use an equation from this one by flipping it, you just change the sign of the E value. So on one side of the battery, we're going to have, I don't know. It'll be written like this. We'll and have silver in one side and uh -huh. copper in the other. And then the other side will be written with, this will be flipped the other way. Okay. I'll show you how to use that in just a second. That's what the chart looks like. And these are the, the uh, standard, standard reduction potentials for half cells, half reaction potentials. 
And that's because they're measured against this one that we take as zero. But now that they're all um, measured against that one, we can compare each one against the other one. And when we build our cell using various half cells, we can determine um, which way it's going to be spontaneous. Is it going to be spontaneous the way we wrote it originally, or is it going to be spontaneous the other direction? Uh, against hydrogen, fluorine has the highest uh, EMF of all the ones that we see reported. This is not a complete chart. You'd have to go to a, maybe the CRC handbook would give you a more complete. I'm just going to say this feels so much less like chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> Right, we're, we're dipping into physics here a little bit. Okay. So here's the way your book presents it. They say, um, you select something to be the anode and something to be the cathode. And then you take the anode voltage and you subtract it from the cathode voltage. And you see what the cell voltage is. If the cell voltage is negative, then you've got them in the wrong order. That one needs to be over here and this one needs to be over there. That's the way the book presents it. I got a different way that I, I like better. For example, here are two half reactions, the Fe3 plus to the Fe2 plus uh, reduction is 0.77 volts, okay? The copper two plus to the copper is 0.34 volts, okay? Wait, I think I'm getting volts and amps mixed up. No, we're not talking about amps. Because I was like, 0.77, that's quite a bit, but you can take a lot of volts. You just can't take more than, they think you can only take one amp, even back in the jet like. Oh, are you talking about electrocution? Yeah, yeah. I, was, I was trying to, uh, quantify how much charge that would actually be. 0.77 volts is very, very low. Yeah, it's a small voltage. I mean, you can stick a nine volt battery to your tongue and you feel a tingle. Yeah. Not that I've ever done that. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> uh, okay, so these are both reductions, right? So we need to flip one over to make it an oxidation, right? That needs to be the anode. And the, then we leave the other one where it is to make a cathode. What you do is you look at it and say, all right, which one of these will flip and give us a positive summation, right? If we flip this one, that'll give us a negative because that'll be negative would be, uh, the summation there would be a, a negative value, right? So this is the one that needs to be flipped. This is the anode. So we flip that one, it becomes minus 0.34. Then you add them together, and you find that you, you have a voltage of 0.43 volts, plus 0.43 volts if you use those two cells. Now, these half reactions and the cell itself, these are uh, expressions of intensity properties. In other words, it doesn't matter how much you have in there, you get the same volt voltage. Really? Like there's nothing you can do to make your half reactions have more energy transmitted to them? Right. You're fixed at that voltage under standard conditions. And um, the only thing you can do is make them last longer. Right. So if you have a, a more concentrated solution on either side, then the battery will last longer. So basically, that's very limited applications. Uh, well, that is a restriction, right, to the engineers in making batteries. Uh -huh. uh, so what we have is um, the summation of the two Uh, in terms of voltage will give us 
the, let's see, it's on the next page, the uh, 0.43 volts, right? So that will be the volts, voltage of this cell using these two half cells. Now, the only reason that we would say uh, two times the iron is to be sure that the electrons are balanced. But that's not important for determining this value. That value is independent of this balanced equation. The place where you need this balanced equation is to determine how many electrons are transferred in the balanced equation. In this case, there are two moles of electrons transferred. We're gonna use that later. So just hold, on, hold that thought. But as far as the voltage goes, that's an intensity factor. It only matters what's the half cell voltage and how do you add them together to give you a spontaneous reaction. Okay. Now, <clears throat> those, that voltage that we reported as the summation of the cathode and the anode um, is under standard conditions. That's E0. The actual voltage has to be calculated using uh, an equation called the Nernst equation. It takes into effect, into account, whether the conditions are, are uh, at standard conditions or they're not at standard conditions. I think you're not going to be using the Nernst equation. Oh yeah, we'll use it. Mm -hmm. We're not going to use the, uh, the generalized Nernst equation. We're going to use the specific Nernst equation that takes into account most often encountered um, environmental conditions. Right? That makes it a lot easier to deal with. If this were an engineering course, if you were going for an electrical engineering degree, you'd have to use the one with all its various variables in there, then you'd have to put them in as needed. We're going to simplify it. Okay. Um, okay, this exercise is, is a little hard to follow. I don't know if I want to do it right now. From strongest to weakest oxidizing agent. Remember, the oxidizing agent is the one that is reduced. So the one that is most likely to be reduced which has the strongest tendency to be reduced is going to be the strongest oxidizing agents. So we look at the uh, re standard reductions for each one of these and we see that, okay, the F minus is on the wrong side. It needs to be over here. The Na plus, that's right, it's okay there. The chlorine is there, that's fine because we want to find the one with the highest voltage for reduction. That makes it the strongest oxidizing agent. Uh, this one is Fe, so we need to flip that equation too. <coughs> okay, so let's do that one. We're gonna flip the fluorine first. So the, the value here becomes negative. Uh, sodium needs to be replaced with sodium on this side, right? So there's your voltage. And then uh, chlorine, okay, that's fine. So why is fluorine fine, but fluorine is not? Because to, because the, casual, to the casual observer, F2 and CO2 are the same. Um, no, because the... Because the, you want to get F minus. The species is what we're looking for, oh. right? F minus. And then we've got iron. So we need, we need each one of these on the left-hand side and its potential. So each of these blue potentials, uh, well, that's not, that should be blue. There we go. So sodium has the strongest, the highest EMF for 
um, let's see. Strongest oxidizing agent is most easily reduced. So it's the strongest oxidizing agent has the highest voltage. It's very easy to make the tape for electrons. Yeah. And then we just put them in order by their voltages. If it's negative, you said that means that it actually takes some human or some intervention to actually make it happen. It's not going to be spontaneous. Right. So, so that gives us our order. Oxidizing sodium would actually take a little bit work. Uh, this oxidizing this is, sodium is negative 2.71 volts. Oh, that's reduction. Reducing it. Oh, okay. So reducing sodium actually takes a little bit of intervention. Yeah. Okay. Um, so when we when we write one of these, I mean, you can do it this way and draw the picture, but um, we need a way, an, an easier way to notate the uh, galvanic cell. And the line notation has been developed to do that. So that you can just, you can write it out. You don't have to draw pictures. So we, we sometimes you have to draw your cell out to know how to do the line notation. But once the line notation is written, um, you can go with that. The anodes are on the left. That's why I wrote this one up like this with anodes over here. It's easier to transfer it to the line notation because it's going to be on the left. Uh, so the oxidation sites on the left, reduction sites on the right, and they are separated by a double line. So what happens on the left is separated is separated what happens on the right by a double line. And you can think of that double line as the salt bridge or the porous disc. Okay, so uh, we should put the concentrations, if there are any. And here's an example. So with this one, the magnesium solid and a single vertical line means a phase difference, right? So we got a phase difference from um, solid to aqueous. So we need that line. Then we have the uh, separation of the cells. And uh, in this case, the anode says we're going to oxidize. So we've oxidized magnesium at zero <coughs> oxidation state to two plus. So this oxidizes to that. And then on this side, we reduce aluminum three plus in aqueous solution to aluminum metal. So we oxidize from here to here, we reduce from there to there. Okay? And if you know the concentrations, then you put them in. If you don't put any concentrations in there, for these, of course, then you have to assume that it's a uh, standard cell. C0. If you put the concentrations in there, then you can calculate the actual potential using the Nernst equation. Here we go. And of course, the, oh, this is a case, if you have a, a half reaction where the electrode doesn't participate in the reaction. In other words, the 
uh, reaction itself is it's all occurring in solution, but you need to access the electrons, then use an inert uh, electrode, some conductor. Okay, so let's say we want to build a cell with uh, silver and iron three plus to iron two plus as our half cells. <laughs> Which one of these would have to be flipped to make the anode so that we come out with a positive value? Right. So we have to make this one negative. If we make that one negative, then we're the total would be negative. So make this one negative. That was 0.03 volts. So it's very low voltage for this reaction. Okay. So that gives us our complete reaction and the standard potential is 0.03 volts. So the silver and the iron are silver is one side and iron is the other? Yes. They're separated. Mm -hmm. Those two half reactions are separated. And uh, if you look on your, your table, um, find silver, iron, let's see, silver, silver, silver. Second one from the top. That's the wrong silver. Yeah, yeah, we need silver metal. That's a two plus to a one plus. Oh, nice. That's interesting. Okay, it must be on the next one. There it is, silver, 0.8 volts, silver plus one to silver metal. And then the other one, uh, two steps below it. How can you tell? You have to be given. Oh, yeah. AG2 plus and then just AG plus. Right, you have, to, you have to be told what the reactions are. Okay, uh, let's see. So the, the one with iron in it is the anode, because it goes from two plus to three plus, it loses electrons, and the silver goes from silver plus one to silver metal in the process. So that's what our cell would look like with the anode on the left and the iron and the cathode on the right. And these standard conditions. So the reaction, it's kind of hard to see there, but the reaction is going to be from uh, Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus, but the electrode itself doesn't participate. So we just make it out of platinum. That way it can pick up the electrons and send them over to the other side. In that process. Okay, line notation would look like this. You've got platinum, and then there's a phase difference. Then you have Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus. There's no phase difference here, so we just put a comma. Right. So there's the actual reaction. But this vertical line means there's a difference in phase from this electrode to this reaction. Then there's the salt bridge. And then we're reducing silver to silver solid. And there's our phase difference line. And there's the conductor meaning that wire is made of platinum because it's not going to take the electron or anything? This part is made of platinum in contact with the solution. The rest of the wire can be copper as long as it doesn't come in contact with the solution. Because if it comes in contact with the solution, it may produce a side reaction. Uh, that would probably be safe. Yeah. Um, unless we have gold in here that can tell us differently. There's gold. There's gold at 1.5. Gold might participate. Oh, platinum. Hmm? It's just one proton and one electron difference between platinum. Um, platinum. Is platinum in here? 
or do you just have to choose one that won't react with that specific reaction? Yeah, and a platinum, I think that's why platinum, platinum for two reasons. It doesn't corrode, it's, it's very inert, it's a noble metal, like gold. But uh, it also uh, rarely participates, uh, rarely has uh, sufficient EMF or half cell potential to react with other things. That doesn't mean it can't. I mean, if you consider how you get platinum in the first place, well, you have certain chemical reactions that you can undergo. But final purification may require some electrochemical cell. Right? And actually, it would be the reverse. Generally, it's the reverse of the galvanic cell. You take a non spontaneous reaction, you increase the voltage artificially from an external source, drive the reaction backwards. That can occur. Okay, uh, let's see. All right, so we've, we've that's nothing new. Okay, let's look at let's look at um, this reaction where we have copper on one side and silver on the other side. Silver is in the cathode, copper is the anode, and the standard potential is 0.46 volts. Okay, that's given to you, so that we can we can do the discussion without having to take time to do all that calculation. This cell setup is given. Now, what happens if on the anode side, we um, increase the copper concentration? We'll look at the half reaction. We're gonna leave the silver alone for now, right? But what if we increase the copper concentration? It's gonna drive the reaction backwards toward copper. And that's what we don't want in our cell, right? Because if we're driving it back towards copper, that means we're not uh, oxidizing the copper anymore as much, right? So the electrons are not being transferred through the wire over to the silver cell as there's not the force there that you would have uh, at a lower concentration. So increasing the concentration of copper ions in that solution um, will actually decrease the cell potential <coughs> based on the Chatelier's principle. Um, let's see. Yeah, okay. So this is just a, uh, uh, a throwback to the maximum available work. Right. So what we have is um, the cell potential and the work, and they have to have opposite signs for a similar reason to uh, the opposing signs when we were talking about delta G. <sighs> delta G and work. So what we have is the maximum available work is the charge transferred times the maximum cell potential. Q means charge? Yes. Uh, right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, is that conventional standards? Uh, that should be, we should have, we should have included that in the discussion because previously Q meant P, right? Now Q means charge. Okay. And Q is in terms of Coulombs. So, 
the actual work, of course, is going to be less. That's, that's a given. But this is the maximum available work from the uh, cell potential. And this cell potential um, doesn't have to be under standard conditions, right? Because there, there's no zero there. It's whatever the standard the potential actually is. Uh, and then times the charge transferred in the process. That determines the maximum amount of work. Here we go. Q is the quantity of charge in coulombs. That should have been on the previous slide. Um, this may come in handy later. This value, the Faraday. It's equal to the charge in coulombs on one mole of electrons. So this is the charge in coulombs on one mole of electrons. When we start um, equating, say, the plating out of metals based on how much charge is transferred, we need some way to convert the number of electrons to the charge so that we can uh, do this calculation in terms of voltage. So just that one's given. I mean, it's in your useful information, so you don't have to memorize it. Faraday. Yeah, the Faraday. So how many coulombs are on one mole? So electrons. And my guess is that that's a ratio of uh, the number of moles and the number of charge items in the coulomb, 6, 6 6.24 times 10 to the 18. Two very arbitrary numbers. Uh, they, they seem arbitrary, but... At least a mole makes sense now. One mole of potassium weighs 39 grams, one mm -hmm. mole of silicon weighs 28 grams. It makes sense now. Right. I don't understand that. But those, those who actually uh, standardize those values have methods for determining what those values should be. Right. And the mole has been refined over the years. You know, 6.022, yeah, that's good enough for us. But they carry it out to like uh, 10 decimal places. Right, and 8, 9, 10 decimal place changes over time. Does that mean you can calculate how much a proton and electron and neutron weigh? Yeah. Or at least all three of them combined? No, you can calculate individuals. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess if you made like a, an anion or cation. And there are instruments now that are sensitive enough to, to actually weigh them. Yeah, they might use. They may not use the same process that we do in a, in a balance, electronic balance. They use a different process that is sensitive to the, that level, but it's still considered weighing. Okay, so the maximum amount of work is actually equal to the change in free energy, right? We know that. And if we set the change in free energy equal to the other value that we determined for work, um, the charge times the uh, maximum potential, then we get this expression where delta G is uh, negative uh, Q times E max. Uh, and this is where the Faraday comes in. So N is the number of moles of electrons transferred, and F is the Faraday constant times the E. So if we back up, okay, here we go. Faraday is this many coulombs per mole, right? So if this is coulombs per mole of electrons and this is moles of electrons, that term there becomes coulombs, which is this Q. So that's how they fit together. Okay, so here's restated. So a positive E, um, a positive E value 
implies that a negative delta G value. Right? So if we have a positive here, then this value becomes negative due to that sign. And that also means spontaneous. Negative G spontaneous, positive E spontaneous. And that's how the two are related. Now, you can also set up um, an anode and a cathode half cells with the same reactions in each one. If they're equal in concentration on both sides, you'll get nothing. Right? There's no EMF to transfer electrons if the concentration on this side is the same as the concentration on that side, for this example, silver, silver, right? But if you change the concentrations, well, they're not the same concentration, are they? Not this one, no. Yeah. I was leading into that. Mm -hmm. If they're the same concentration, they're at equilibrium, and there's no EMF, right? But if one is uh, a different concentration than the other, then the lower concentration becomes the anode, and the higher concentration becomes the cathode. And we're gonna build one of those in the lab. That's our second cell. We're gonna build a cell with copper and zinc. Then we're gonna build a cell with, uh, I think, copper and copper at two different concentrations. And measure the uh, voltage produced by that concentration cell. Uh, okay, I thought there was going to be more discussion about this. Um, if you look at the difference in concentration, what you're tending to do is with this low concentration, this is a, a, a qualitative discussion of the two cells. Right? We're not quantitative right now. But with this half cell at 0.1 molar, the tendency is for uh, this electrode to be eroded and to put more silver in solution for that half cell. Whereas this one is higher concentration and the tendency is to take more of that silver and convert it to metallic silver and plate it on the electrode. Right? If we just think of the Chatelier's principle, this one's the higher one, so it's going to be consumed and this one's the lower one, it's going to be well, it's not consumed. This part's consumed to produce that metal, and this part is uh, eroded to produce more of this metal. So what we're tending to do is try to bring the concentrations close to each other. So 0.1 molar needs to increase, one molar needs to decrease to get you to an equilibrium state, okay? All right, now for the Nernst equation. This is the Nernst equation in its purest form. So the standard potential minus the gas constant times uh, temperature in Kelvin divided by the number of uh, moles of electrons transferred times the Faraday constant, then all that times the natural log of the Q. So the Q, remember, uh, is you have to write out your complete equation, and then you take products divided by reactants. Okay. But what we're going to do is say, uh, we know this value is R. We know that uh, most often the reaction is going to take place at room temperature, 25 degrees, so we plug that one in. And then we stick in this Faraday constant. And then we also convert the natural log to the common log. Because common logs are easier to deal with than natural logs. Why is that? Because uh, natural logs are base E, 2.303, blah, 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 blah. Those are base 10. And base 10, right. And since we're using scientific notation, sometimes base 10 is, is much easier to deal with. So we're also gonna take this factor and multiply it times that, times that, divide by that, 
And that gives us a new value of, over here of 0 0.0591 divided by the number of electrons transferred in moles. Uh, and then times the common log of Q. This is the one that is more useful to us, that one right there. And all of this over here, that's just um, proving that this conversion right here from the natural log works. <laughs> I'll just take the word for it. I need to prove it. Ah, well, okay. I was proving it to myself. How about that? <laughs> okay. So, what happens if we have this equation, right? And let's say that Q in this case is actually K, right? Say we are at equilibrium. If we are at equilibrium and Q equals K, then we can substitute K in here, but the actual voltage is zero. At equilibrium, the actual voltage is zero. Well, it makes sense with the more electrons moving back and forth. Right. This is the uh, standard potential, so it still stays. And if we uh, uh, rearrange standard potential and we know how many moles are transferred in the reaction, we can determine K just by knowing what the standard potential is. Okay, so there's another way to determine K. Uh, we did that with, um, uh, in the last chapter, we could determine K uh, under the certain conditions. Uh, this is another way to determine K. All right. So how are we doing on time? 11.15? Mm -hmm. We're good till, we got another hour. Okay. I, I think we're good. I think we can finish. Let's say we'll make a pretty good time. Yeah, I think we can finish. For this oxidation reduction reaction, um, the half reactions are, uh, this is our, Okay, the way it's written, this is the one that is being reduced, that sulfur from here to here, with this standard potential. And this one we're saying is oxidized, which makes sense, it's going from two plus to three plus, but the standard reduction potential is here, so that means this one needs to be flipped. That one becomes a positive. We add the two together and we get a voltage of uh, 0 0.67 volts. Right? If we can set these up in two half cells and connect them, we'll get 0 0.67 volts. Now, what's the actual voltage? Or what's, let's see, what's the question? Balance the equation and calculate E0 and K. Okay, so we're interested only in doing K right now. Okay. So there's our, uh, we flip this reaction to oxidation because it's the anode. And then in order to, to balance them, we need two electrons here, right? So once we do that, we can add them together. And for every two moles of chromium two, uh, let's see, N equals two. Remember on the previous slide, there's the two electrons. Two moles of electrons are transferred. Okay, we need to know that for uh, E. Right, so that two goes right in here. And log of K is this, and we just rearrange the Nernst equation, right, so that we can solve for, uh, we know 0 0.67 goes in here, we just calculated that. We know two moles goes here, that's a, a constant. 
then we can solve for log k is this value, so k is the anti-log of 22.6. And there's our k value, four times 10 to the 22nd. It's a huge number, right? And that's typical for spontaneous electrochemical reactions to have a monstrous, monstrously large K value, right? It favors products. Okay, when E equals zero, that's when you got a dead battery, right? Uh, when E zero is equal to zero, what do you have? That's for a concentration cell. Remember, we said that concentration doesn't matter. The number, uh, when you balance the equations, it doesn't matter the factors because it's in intensity. So if you're trying to compare this half cell with that half cell, and the half cells are equivalent, E zero has to be zero. Right? The standard potential has to be zero for concentration cell because you've got two equivalent cells, okay? So how do we get a voltage out of it? Well, that's what we're gonna do here with this nickel, nickel cell. Uh, this concentration for one side, the cathode is one molar, and for the anode is 10 to the minus fourth molar. So there's quite a difference there. So in order to keep our cathode and anode separate, we use subscripts. This is the cathode side, this is the anode side, right? The oxidation. So when we combine them, we get this one and this one are the only ones that can go into an expression of Q, right? Because solids don't count, right? So if this is the balanced equation, right? Concentrated anode solid, uh, and here, plus uh, cathode, cathode solid and anode, then we take what's the anode concentration? 10 to the minus four. What's the cathode concentration? Uh, is uh, one, right? So there's the anode over cathode, and there's the anode over cathode, and we know that there are two electron, two moles of electrons being transferred, so here's our concentration cell voltage. Based on that difference, the actual voltage is 0.118. Why? Because E zero is zero right here. Right there, right there is zero. So the only thing left is this part of the expression. So we plug in our values for Q and our moles for electrons, and we calculate the voltage of a concentration cell. 0.118 in this case. That's actually pretty good. Um, I think the one we're gonna do is, is like no more than a tenth of that. So you're gonna measure, actually you're gonna measure your voltage for your concentration cell next week. You'll measure it in millivolts, <laughs> right? So this one will be 118 millivolts. So basically you wouldn't be able to feel it Right. <laughs> the only way you can know there's a voltage is with What's a... What's the uh, electric current of a heart? Huh? What's the electric current of a heart? Current of a heart? In volts. Yeah. Or voltage of a heart? Uh, um, I'm thinking it's measured in millivolts. I'd say probably not very much. Yeah. Yeah. Are you talking about the, the membrane potential? Yeah. Because, yeah. uh, you know, you have the ESA mode and the... The yeah, the, the difference in charge across the membrane as the as the wave travels through the muscle is probably in millivolts. And you can say that for nerves too. Yeah, the the difference in membrane potential mm. is in millivolts. So we had a scientist that he wasn't measuring um, uh, animal potentials like muscles and nerves, but he was measuring potentials across membranes of plant cells. With microelectrodes, probably not very much. No, that's millivolts. Huh? 
yeah. But he based his whole career on the stuff. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Uh, all right, so we could take time to do this one. If you have a, a nickel electrode and a silver electrode, uh, you can decide which one is the cathode, which one's the anode. The, the nickel, uh, we would need to change the silver uh, standard reduction potential to an oxidation in order to get a positive value. So this would be your anode, this would be your cathode. Come on, there we go. Uh, this is what it would look like drawing it. I found this program on the internet where I can, I can do this stuff, draw it. So the, uh, wait a minute. There might be a mistake in, this, in these slides. Back up, back up, back up. Come on. I really want you to look at that battery. Yeah. Uh, it's saying that silver is, let's go back. Silver, silver, silver. Uh, there's silver. 0.8. That's wrong. That's wrong right there. I think it should be, this is the nickel and this is the silver. Let's look at the nickel. Nickel two plus, nickel two plus. Should be negative 0.23. Yep, that's an error. That slide is wrong. I think the subsequent slides have been corrected. But that one slide is wrong, setting up the problem. Uh, here we go. Nickel. Silver. Okay. This printout is right. One, two, three. Nickel. Yeah, that one's. That one's good. This one's not. Okay, this slide is wrong. This needs to be reversed. Okay. You think after using these slides so many times that have all the errors fixed. <clears throat> okay, so uh, this one is correct, I think. Nickel point eight. No, this one's wrong also. Right, so these two are wrong. When we get to this one, no, nope. here, this part is right. The cathode is silver at point eight volts. The anode is nickel at 0.23 volts, and the overall cell potential is 1.03 volts. All right, this is wrong. This is right. Yeah, yeah this is flipped. Yeah, yeah. Okay, <clears throat> so practical applications. The most common so galvanic cell being used today is the lead acid battery. Sulfuric acid? Sulfuric acid is the electrolyte. And uh, that's one of the advantages of the lead acid battery because the medium um, for each cell, the solution part, is exactly the same. So you don't need a salt bridge. Right? You just need to keep your plates separated. One plate is pure lead, and the other plate is lead oxide, uh, PDO2. 
Um, so here's the cathode is uh, is PBO2, and the anode is lead. So the, the lead is going to be consumed, right, as it gives up its electrons, transfers them over to the PBO2, and but it doesn't convert it to lead. Let's see, do I give you the half reactions? No, I don't. Shoot. I need to include half reactions there. Um, in the process, um, both reactions produce lead sulfate as a product, right? So this uh, anode, let's see, let's put the cathode first. Cathode, uh, as the sulfate, and the, uh, this is the cathode, and the anode, as the lead, And this produces that, and this produces that. These are both solids. So they're deposited on the electrodes, on both the anode and the cathode in the process. Um, now that, that's not balanced, but this goes from uh, zero to two plus, right? So that's the anode, it's being oxidized. And this is uh, four plus, because this is two minus times two is four plus, four minus, four plus. And this goes to two plus, right? So this is the cathode. We're reducing that iron to, uh, lead to this lead, and we're uh, oxidizing that lead to this lead, okay? So, uh, this gets deposited on the electrodes, and when you, when your alternator is running, it drives these reactions in reverse. So this becomes the cathode, and this becomes the anode. When you apply voltage to it in in excess of uh, two volts, so so your alternator drives two volts in the other direction because each one of these cells. is two volts, right? That's why you have six of them makes a 12 volt battery. And you look at the top of your battery, well, it used to be, you have six plugs, one for each cell. And in, in uh, physics, if you put um, batteries in sequence, then they add up, right? If you put them in parallel, you just get a battery that lasts longer. So, um, where was I going with this? Oh, okay, so uh, each of your electrodes gets uh, lead to sulfate deposited on it. And when you drive the reactions in reverse, you reconstitute that one over here and that one over there. And that works for a while. But if you let it discharge, each time you let the battery uh, discharge and draw energy from it, you deposit more of this in there, and it, <coughs> it becomes occluded within the electrode. So you don't always get all of it converted backwards. You get the same voltage. It's just that eventually, you get so much of this on the battery that the solution has, can't access the underlying electrode. And when that happens, your battery is said to be sulfated out. It's dead and cannot be recharged. So if, if you ever have a dead battery and the technician says, I can't do anything with this, that's what is, the problem is. So the only thing you can do is send it to recycling. They take those plates, 
grind them up, separate, and reconstitute. But you can't do anything in situ with a lead acid battery that's gone that way. Okay. All right, so let's finish this thing up. Uh, other types of batteries, this is the uh, dry cell battery, and there are various uh, combinations of chemistries that will produce a, a, uh, a dry cell battery. And it's not really dry. In other words, you don't get these reactions unless you've got a solution. Now the solution can be very thick and pasty, like it is in here, but you still need a solution, otherwise the, the ions won't move. You won't get uh, an interaction that produces the, uh, the, the uh, desired reactions. Uh, in this case, there's your cathode, which is a carbon rod, and your anode is the casing, the zinc casing of the battery. Other types, uh, mercury battery, we don't use these very often anymore. I don't even know why I put that one on there. <laughs> um, all dry cell batteries have a little bit of mercury in them. Um, and the reason is that you, you need that mercury in there to make electrical contact. This is just an efficient thing source of material. Uh, they don't show it in here, but there's a little bead of mercury, I think, right up in here to make sure that the contact is maintained. There's not much, but I guess if you throw enough of them in, in a landfill and they disintegrate, then you eventually get a significant you contamination. Disintegrate in the landfill? Huh? Batteries? Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. Huh. Yeah, they'll corrode. From the inside and the outside. Speaking of corrosion, rust oxidizing, mm -hmm. is that literally just the metal using electrons to break them down? Yeah, I think I have a slide in it. Um, this one is a fuel cell, the holy grail of automotive transport. The uh, hydrogen oxygen fuel cell, because its byproduct is water. That's it water and power. So that's good. So uh, the problem is, well, twofold, two major problems. Um, we don't have a concentrated enough source of hydrogen uh, to carry a car a distance of three or 400 miles, which is required to that's market. Somewhere. Yeah. Um, Wait, so we can't just put hydrogen from the, like harvest hydrogen from the air to put in there? No, it's not concentrated enough. Is that concentrated? Or would it just be a big tank regardless of how much you concentrate it? Yeah, that too, right. Uh, if you had enough hydrogen to, uh, pure hydrogen in a compressed tank, it would be at 3,000, 3,500 PSI, which would be a hazard. Um, <laughs> just a little bit. Uh, there are, there are compounds or, or um, minerals or, or other types of uh, substances that you can put in that tank that will absorb hydrogen and release it as on demand. But the, the uh, concentration of hydrogen in those tanks is a lot lower than it would be in a compressed tank. <clears throat> but it would be safer. The other thing is, actually the three things, um, the second thing I was thinking of was uh, fuel cells generally operate at very, very high temperatures. Hmm. Now, that has been um, mitigated somewhat over the years, brought the temperatures down, but they're still very hot. So that's an issue. Uh, and the other issue is infrastructure. If you're going to travel for 300 miles, you need to have a gas station somewhere that supplies hydrogen. <laughs> Uh, okay, corrosion. What is corrosion? Well, 
Corrosion is the process of, of taking a metal and converting it, uh, oxidizing it into some ionic form. I guess that makes sense since uh, cars are alloys, they're not pure metal, they're not pure iron. Right. I guess they're iron and tin. Mm. It depends. They're going to be iron and carbon for sure, steel, and then certain other minerals that enhance their. What about aluminum? Is the like, aluminum I mean pure aluminum, or is it an alloy as well? It's usually an alloy. Aluminum itself is just too soft. Hmm. Aircraft aluminum is an alloy, and that's usually the, the standard that we go by for producing structural types of aluminum. It's still light, but strong enough. Uh, it's not as strong as steel, but it's a lot lighter. And it's, uh, isn't it more flexible? Yeah, it does flex. Mm -hmm. I've uh, heard of it, that's why they would use it in uh, skyscrapers, because that way it, would, it has a little bit of give uh -huh. um, instead of, so it would just break, say, in our most yeah. winds. Uh, there's another type of steel that's being used. It's called high strength steel. I'm not sure how they make it, but they, they use it in automobiles because you can use thinner panels, which reduces weight, but you still get the same strength. Uh, back to corrosion. So here's the, the process of corrosion of uh, iron or steel. And what happens is with the water droplet sets up um, a small battery just within that drop and this is the anodic part which is actually converting iron into uh, Fe2 and this is the cathodic part which is actually uh, uh, let's see this oxidizes iron and this side uh, reduces oxygen there it is. So we're adding electrons and we're producing um, uh, going from zero to uh, two minus. And that's why gold doesn't uh, rust, it's just pure AU. So there's that kind of to return to. Um, in, the in the general environment, conditions are not right for converting uh, gold into its ions. Yeah. You can still, you can find gold in compound, but it's not common. It's usually found in pure form. Uh, one of the, here's a concept. Uh, when you bury something in the ground and it becomes rock, like coal and so forth, the environment is reducing not oxidizing. So it tends to produce reduced products. And reduced products are a store of energy. So that's why we, we want fossil fuels because they are a store of energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm just waiting for the day of the entire, I don't know, what's the desert of California? I wanted to say Sahara. I'm sure it's not bad. No. I'm pretty sure that was Africa. Oh, were you talking about Death Valley? Yeah, I just cover that entire thing in solar panels. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so how do we protect metals from corrosion? Well, of course, we can uh, cover them because if you can exclude oxygen and water, right, you don't get that galvanic cell set up. So that's where we paint or we, we coat the the uh, metal with some other type of metal that um, is more reactive <coughs> than oxygen. Right. Uh, galvanizing is an example. So you, you dip your bucket in zinc and uh, that protects it. Right? The, the zinc corrodes rather than the underlying metal. Um, another thing that you can do is alloy. Right? Stainless steel is an alloy. And um, originally, I can't remember the guy's name, who developed uh, stainless steel had about 35% chromium in steel. So that's quite a large amount. 
But what would happen was chromium is more easily uh, oxidized than iron. So when you, if you get a scratch on the surface, it just instantly oxidizes and seals the cut, seals the, the wound. And it happens at a microscopic level, so you could, you could scratch it and, you know, that shiny piece of, of uh, stainless steel, you wouldn't even notice. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, another way of protection is called cathodic protection. So if, you're, if your pipes, your iron pipes are buried in the ground, naturally they're gonna start to corrode. So what you do is you connect a wire to the pipe and connect it to a metal that corrodes more easily. And as it corrodes, it, it delivers those electrons that are being brought, that are being taken away from the metal and sends it through the wire just like it was a battery sends it over to the iron pipe and delivers those electrons uh, to the iron and keeps it in the uh, metallic state. That's cathodic protection. There you go. They use that on ships too. Like they'll, they'll rivet a belt of, of zinc around the hull of the ship, blow the water line, and uh, that will protect the, the ship as the zinc corrodes. But since zinc is not cheap, what they do is they take a wire, connect it to the zinc, and as long as the, there's power in the ship, they send a direct current of electrons into that zinc, and that keeps the zinc from corroding too. It's just when it sits and there's no power to it that the zinc starts to corrode and does its thing but as long as they can deliver a direct current of electrons into that zinc belt, it will protect the hull. Now that doesn't keep the barnacles off of it. You gotta do something different for that. Uh, okay, so what's electrolysis? Electrolysis is the opposite of our galvanic cell. In other words, you take a galvanic cell and if you want the reaction to revert, runs spontaneously one direction, but you want it to go the other direction, you send a voltage into it that it exceeds its galvanic voltage and it'll drive the reaction backwards. Huh? Now that would do it. But sometimes, um, say you, wanna, you have a mixture of metals, metal ions, and you want to plate them out on the cathode but you want to do it selectively. Well, you know what their half cell voltage is. So if you put drive a voltage through it um, at or just barely above the voltage for that metal, then the highest voltage, the highest um, uh, standard electro potential will be plated out first. And then once it's gone, you can increase the voltage and get the next one. So you can use that to separate metals. Okay. So what's the stoichiometry of electrolysis? Um, what we're trying to do is obtain a certain amount of a metal at the tail end. And to do that, we have to drive a certain current, direct current of electricity through the reaction to drive it backwards. Uh, and that has to occur for a certain amount of time, right? So current times time will give you the amount of charge in coulombs. Then you convert the coulombs to the moles of electrons that are being delivered. And then the moles of electrons are used in the stoichiometry of the reaction <coughs> to tell you how many moles of metal you produce and you convert that to grams. Okay, so it's, it's a multi-step process. Um, and we need to know these values. So a mole of electrons equals coulombs times this uh, Faraday. That, that value, that value is actually the inverse of Faraday. 
one mole per this many coulombs. So here's our example. We're going to identify this metal. And what we need to do is, um, for this much time, 52.8 seconds, we send a current of two amps to a plate that's immersed uh, in a solution. And, uh, and it plates out 0 0.0719 grams of metal. And the solution we know is this nitrate. So we know the metal is a three plus charge. Right? You're given that information. So what do we need to know to find out what this metal is? Well, the molar mass would help. Right? If we know the molar mass, we can come pretty close to what it is. We already know the mass, right? Right here. So we just need to find out how many moles of that metal were transferred in the process, okay? So two amps for 52.8 seconds. Come on. There's our stoichiometry, right? That, we're gonna add three electrons to that metal. We know the metal is three plus to produce this, right? So an amp is a coulomb per second. That's what an amp is. And the volt is? Uh, a volt is uh, uh, a joule second. That much work per second, in a second. <laughs> so if we know two amps is this many coulombs per second, and we know how many seconds it took, then we know that we used two times 52.8 seconds, okay? Uh, uh, excuse me, uh, two times 52.8 coulombs. Yeah. I'll ask you a question real fast. Yeah. Um, I have a doctor's appointment at 1230. Can I get a printout of the test so I can bring it to the room or on Wednesday? I can, yeah, I can get you a copy of it. Okay. Can you give me a couple minutes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can wait out here. <clears throat> Okay, so um, this part of us tells how many coulombs were actually transferred. This converts to how many electrons were required, right? We're gonna cancel the coulombs. This is dimensional analysis, right? So we'll cancel the coulombs and this is how many electrons. So then the electrons then tell us how many moles of metal, right? So this is the ratio, one mole of that metal per three electrons. And that tells us how many moles of the metal. Now that we can calculate that many grams per mole gives us 197 grams per mole. Our metal is gold. Wow. Okay. Uh, oh, here's an example. We've got a solution of this concentration of each of these ions, and we want to predict the order that the metals played out as we turn the voltage up. First of all, where did the metals form? They form at the cathode, right? Because that's where reduction takes place. So the cathode being the site of reduction, the reduction potential will predict the order, right? So the more positive the standard reduction potential, uh, that's the first one to play it out because the higher the E, the more spontaneous the reaction. So you've got a high E value, then it takes less voltage to drive that reduction. So here are the standard potentials for each one of those metals. Right. And it looks like the largest E value is copper. It's going to come out first. Then the next one, um, 
uh, as, as we go down, this one gets smaller, this one's even smaller, this one's smaller. So I've got them in order here. So this is the order that they're played out. Copper, lead, tin, nickel, and zinc. Okay, electrolytic processes. The production of aluminum, um, what was that guy's name? Do I have it? Hall, yeah. Hall was an undergraduate student. And he determined that he was gonna figure out how to produce aluminum um, economically. Um, up to the time he tackled the problem, aluminum was very expensive to produce. In fact, it was more valuable than gold. That's it must be before my time. Oh, long before. Uh, aluminum's the, everything now. The royalty of aluminum of uh, Europe would serve their banquets using aluminum flatware. I bet they feel silly now. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so Hall came up with a way to electrolytically purify uh, bauxite, which is the, the ore uh, from which aluminum uh, metal is derived. Uh, Al203 is, is uh, the... What's the oxygen in random things? Oh yeah, everything's oxidized. Yeah. Um, there are a few metals that are found in pure form, you know, these and these. Right. Not so much silver, but these are noble metals. But everybody else, all the other metals, you don't find them except in oxidized form. Tungsten. Oh. It's over here somewhere. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Tungsten's good because it has a very, very high melting point. Um, so we can purify metals in addition to aluminum. We can plate them out, like we used to have chrome bumpers. You ever seen any cars with chrome bumpers? I've heard about that. Yeah. Um, so that's a plating process. You can't plate chrome directly on iron. Uh, the, the atomic fit is wrong. So you have something in between. Usually copper and nickel will that form. Really um, yeah. Not too bad. I was going to say, I mean, because it's only a thin layer. The car was like five hundred dollars back then, though, so <laughs> couldn't be that expensive. Um, most of the sodium and chlorine in uh, use in industry today is produced by electrolysis of sodium chloride. They just electrolyze it. You get the sodium metal over here, and you get the chlorine gas over here. Then you take it off and do something else with it. Take sodium, make sodium hydroxide. Chlorine, you can burn trenches. Chlor yeah. <laughs> or you, you make the sodium hydroxide and then you take chlorine and then you put it back in the sodium hydroxide and make bleach. Uh, okay. So, oh, this is Hall's process for producing uh, aluminum. Okay. And what you need to produce it is a cheap source of electricity. So initially, uh, Alcoa set up its uh, processing plants in this country uh, near hydroelectric electricity, because that was cheap. Um, but their raw materials had to be brought in from the tropics. So they would go through a, a initial purification process in the tropics and then the ore will be brought up and they finish it off to turn it into pure aluminum oxide, then they could electrolyze it using this. You can electroplate a spoon, right? Or you know how to clean the um, corrosion off your silverware. I mean, it's real silver. You just take your glass tray and you line it with aluminum foil and you put salt water in it and then you take your Silver, just drop it in there, and when it touches that aluminum, the aluminum is sacrificed, and the corroded silver on the surface of your silverware is reconverted back into uh, sil pure silver, 
and then you get shiny metal in here. Most of that corrosion is silver, silver sulfide. Um, the electrolytic process that converts uh, copper roofing to that uh, kind of a greenish blue like the statue would be. patina. Yeah, and that's a conversion of copper into copper sulfide. Chromic sulfide. Yep. <laughs> Uh, okay, so that's enough of that. We'll talk about, um, we'll do review next time, plus the lab. No quick check. Um, I was going to say, that would be the last lab, wouldn't it? We could just not. We did the last semester. <laughs> we'll see. I got a lot of writing to do. It's hard to keep up with the thing. Yeah, that's why you need to, to fill it out before you get the lab. That's why you need to do it the way you're supposed to, as you go. <laughs> all at once at the end. At least I'm not working this semester, this semester, this weekend. Okay, let me turn this off. Okay, we're done. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. So,